Hey, Vanda students, it's Pastor Robbie. So excited to be coming to you with our first ever youth online service. What an awesome time that we live in that we can do this, where we can meet online from the privacy and the comfort and the safety of our own homes. Tonight, we're going to start a new kind of two-week series called Dangerous Prayers. Craig Rochelle of Life.Church wrote a book called Dangerous Prayers, and he also has a seven-day devotional that we're going to go through as a student ministry at the end of this short series that we're going to be preaching the next two weeks. Um, But we want to talk about this concept of dangerous prayers. And you might be thinking, Pastor Robert, we just got through a series called Streaks, where we were talking about praying and reading our Bible and being in community communication and community with God on a daily basis. Why are we talking about prayer again? Well, the reality is prayer is one of the most important aspects to our lives as Christians. It's the way that we ask Christ into our heart. It's the way that we communicate with God on a daily basis. And and what happens oftentimes as Christians is we play is we pray more surface level prayers. We pray prayers that say, God, keep me safe. God, bless me. God, help me pass uh, this test that I didn't even study for. I've done that a couple times, right? And the reality is we, we should pray prayers like that. We should pray prayers that say, God, uh, help me through today. Bless me. Uh, pray for safety for my friends and family. We should pray prayers like that, but those shouldn't be the only prayers that we pray. We should pray bold prayers that require faith, prayers that require a level of boldness that is deeper than just saying, God, keep me safe. A level of prayer that says, I will go where you send me without even knowing where that's going to, I will do what you've called me to do, even if I don't feel like I can accomplish that on my own. I will say what you've asked me to say, even if I don't feel like uh, I have the confidence or the ability to share. We see a story in scripture about two authentically bold men of God, uh, Peter and John, the book of Acts. And it's an incredible story. If you have your Bible, get it out. Open your Bible to the book of Acts. Go to chapter four. We're going to read some scripture here together. Acts chapter four, verse one through seven says, while Peter and John were speaking to the people, they were confronted by the priests and the captain of the temple guard. These leaders were very disturbed that Peter and John were teaching the people that through Jesus, there is a resurrection of the dead. They arrested them. And since it was already evening, they put them in jail until morning. But many of the people who heard their message believed it. So the number of men who believed now totaled about 5,000. The next day, The council of all the rulers and elders and teachers of religious law met in Jerusalem. By what power or in whose name have you done this? So here we see Peter and John have healed a man who's been crippled from birth, right? 40 years, unable to walk, healed them and Je- healed this man in Jesus' name. And they get thrown in jail for preaching the name of Jesus. They come out of jail the next morning and the, the religious leaders, the temple guard, all these people are saying, by what authority have you done this? And I love the next verse. It's one of the most powerful verses in all of scripture. One of my favorite stories in the book of Acts for sure. Uh, Peter literally levels up. Like he's Mario, boop, he hits the thing. The big mushroom comes out. He eats the mushroom and he gets big. Right Here's what Peter says in verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of our people, are we being questioned today because we've done a good deed for a crippled man? Do you want to know how he was healed? Let me clearly state to all of you and to all the people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene. Then he goes on to say this, the man you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead for Jesus is the one referred to in the scriptures where it says the stone that you builders rejected now has become the cornerstone. What a powerfully bold thing for Peter to say in the face of the people who threw him in jail, bring him back out. They had just killed Jesus. They put him on the cross right? And now Peter is out preaching the name of Jesus. And he says, the person you killed, the person you put in the grave has raised from the grave and has healed this man. And he's empowered us to do so through the ability that was given to him by the Holy Spirit. And the story, it just gets better and better. In verse 13, it says this, the members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, for they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in scriptures, but they also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing right there among them, there was nothing the council could say. So they ordered Peter and John out of the council chamber and conferred among themselves. What a powerful testimony. I love it. I love that the scriptures say they had no special training in scriptures. They were ordinary people like you and me, but but they could see 
that they had been with Jesus because of the way their boldness, the way they acted, the way they conducted themselves. Let me ask you a question. Can people sense that you've been with Jesus by the way that you conduct yourself, by the way that you speak, by the words that you say? Can people tell that person's different? And I know that it's because they've been with Jesus. The religious leaders of the day said, you can't preach about Jesus. You can't talk about, you can't heal people that can't walk. Okay. That's not okay anymore, which is crazy if you think about it. But they, the people in charge, the religious leaders, they said to Peter and John, you can't do this anymore. And Peter and John, rather than say, okay, sorry about that. They begin to pray bold, dangerous prayers. God, give us the faith, the confidence, the courage, the strength that we need to continue preaching the name of Jesus. They prayed dangerous prayers. In Acts 4, verse 29, it says this, And now, O Lord, hear their threats and give us, your servants, great boldness in preaching your word. Now, they didn't say, oh, keep us safe from this moment. They didn't say, bless us. They said, give us great boldness in preaching your word, because that is what mattered in that moment. I want to ask you a question. On a scale from 1 to 10, how amazed are people by your boldness? Peter and John in this moment, they're an 11, right? People are just, holy cow, these guys are being thrown in jail. The leaders are saying, stop talking about Jesus. And they say, Jesus, give us the boldness and the ability to continue talking about you, despite what they're saying about us. If we jump forward a couple verses in Acts chapter 5, verse 18, it says this. They arrested the apostles, they arrested Peter and John, and put them in the public jail. Second time in jail in a week. But an angel of the Lord came at night, opened the gates of the jail, brought them out. And then the angel says this to Peter and John, and I love it. Go to the temple and give the people this message of life. Peter and John keep talking about Jesus. The people, the religious leaders, throw them in jail for the second time. And then what happens? An angel of the Lord comes, breaks them out of jail. And then when they're out of jail, doesn't say, go run, hide, you're free, go escape. He says, go back. And keep preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to give you three quick things. I want you to understand this about bold, dangerous prayers. The first thing is this, is that boldness will trigger spiritual opposition. I'm going to read my Bible in school, but then maybe your friends or your teachers even make fun of you. I'm going to pray every morning, but then early morning soccer practice starts. Or I'm going to stop hanging out with those people that are bad influences, but then they find a way to draw you back in. When we step out and make bold declarations for Christ, Satan gets scared and tries to trip you up. You want to know what Satan's not scared of? He's not scared of somebody who calls himself a Christian but comes to church once a month and doesn't spend time with God. He's not. Satan is scared of the Christian who understands the, the power they have through the Holy Spirit and willing to pray these dangerous prayers that says, God, lead me and I will follow regardless of what the people around me are saying or doing. The second thing to understand is this, that boldness will often release God's miracles. We see all the time the stories of people who tithe regularly, who get a check in the mail at just the right time to help sustain them. That is a miracle by God that he gives to his people for being bold, for praying these bold prayers, for living in a way that the rest of the world would say, that's crazy. Boldness often releases God's miracles, right? When Peter and John were thrown in jail, they weren't stuck there for years, right? An angel from heaven came and broke them out. That was a miracle. When you walk in obedience to God, you won't be surprised when you see his miracles working in your life. The last thing I want to mention is this, is that boldness requires faith. Even being rescued from jail twice in a week, Peter and John could have said, you know what, God, I, I've done my part. Like, that's a lot. I've been in jail twice this week. I'm not feeling good. I'm just going to go home. We healed this dude. He can walk now. That's pretty good. I'm done. They didn't say that. They were broke out of jail by an angel. They were instructed to go back and continue preaching, and they did it. They went back and they continued preaching. They had great faith. They prayed dangerous prayers and answered the call of God. When we pray safe prayers, we're saying to God, I don't want to be interrupted. I don't want my life to be inconvenienced, right? I don't, I don't want to stir the pot. I, I don't want to cause any trouble. But God is calling us to have the boldness and the courage to pray prayers that are inconvenient. Pray prayers that say, hey, stop my my life for a moment. Stop what I think should be going on and, and show me what I should be doing. God is calling us to have the boldness to pray these prayers, these dangerous prayers that, that are inconvenient, prayers that might interrupt our day-to-day -day routine. Those are the prayers that reach God's heart. Those are the prayers that God wants us to be praying. I remember a time in my life when I had, we had just gotten married, my wife and I, 
Uh, we had, had our first son. We had bought a house. I was still in college. I was working a full-time job, paying the bills. The stresses of life were just mounting up. And I remember that I prayed a prayer to God saying, God, give me the ability to handle all of this stress. Give me the ability to be calm and not freak out. Give me the ability to talk calmly and not get angry and say things that I don't mean. Give me the ability to just be chill. And I expected God to just change my my habits, right, my attributes. But but he did, but not in the way that I had intended in that moment. I was hoping God would just, okay, here's some peace. But that's not what God did. What I realized is God was giving me an opportunity to learn self-control and patience and all of these things. Because I had prayed this dangerous prayer, God birthed these things within me. And he did in a different way than I thought he might. I want to end our time tonight with this. The most dangerous part about dangerous prayers is the listening part. Prayer is not just talking, it's also listening. When we pray safe prayers, we do all the talking and expect the answer. When we pray dangerous prayers, we have a conversation. We talk and we listen. I'm gonna give you three quick thoughts on how do we hear God's voice in these times of, of praying these dangerous prayers, if the most important aspect to this is listening. The first thing is this, is we have to be still. Psalms 46, 10 says, be still and know that I am God. Be still, calm down, relax, take a deep breath, unplug, sit in your room, read your Bible, pray, meditate on the scriptures, spend time away from everything around you, all the craziness. What's amazing is we have hours on end to watch Netflix. We have hours on end to be on social media. But when it comes to our still time with God, it seems like after a few moments, we're distracted by something else. God wants us to be still. Be still and know that he is God. The second thing is this, be willing. Be still and be willing. Proverbs 3 verse 6 says this, Seek his will in everything you do, and he will show you which path to take. In my life, I found that God gives us very clear instructions, but oftentimes we try to change what that looks like or justify something else. A, a wise mentor once told me that God isn't showing you what's next in your life because you haven't done what he's already said. If you've been in that place where you're wondering, God, what is next for me? What am I supposed to be doing with my life right now? What is the last thing that God spoke to you? Do that. Keep doing it over and over until he speaks again. The last thing is this. Be ready. Hear the voice of God. Be still, be willing, and be ready. When God speaks, be ready to do what he said. In my life, right out of high school, God said, hey, you're supposed to lead worship at this church where you don't really know anybody at. And what's crazy is the year before that, my senior year of high school, I tried out for the senior choir and I didn't even make it, right? And I'm not certainly saying that I have a great voice by any means, but God equipped me to be able to do what he called me to do. I had no teaching and, and singing or music or any of that. And God said, hey, I want you to lead worship for this church. And I did. And for eight years, I led worship at a church and I grew in my faith and I grew in my talents and my abilities because I was ready for the calling when God said, be ready, do this. When God would speak in my life, these big moments, get married, have a kid, be a worship pastor, be a youth pastor, I felt unprepared, I felt unequipped, and I felt unqualified. But I had faith that he knew better than I did, and I boldly stepped into the next season. I prayed the dangerous prayers, God, I'm going to follow you wherever you lead me. When I hear God's voice speak, I'm reminded of the children of Israel who wandered in the desert for 40 years because they didn't listen to God. And my fear is that I would lead my family into the wilderness, into the desert, because I wasn't listening to God. So I'm more afraid of not doing what God told me to do than I am doing what God has called me to do. Tonight, I'm asking you this. Do you have the bold faith to pray the dangerous prayers? To stop living your life as a Christian, as a Sunday morning and a Wednesday night thing, but as a daily thing. If you want to hear the voice of God, if you want to truly be used by him for everything that he's called you to, everything that he's made you for, you have to be willing to pray the dangerous prayers. You have to pray prayers that say, I fully trust in you, God. I will step out of my comfort zone and be used by you regardless of what's going on around me. The reality is this, is we're living in a, a crazy time right now. We're literally having church on the internet because of what's going on in our society. Church in our homes, church in our communities, church with our friends, church in a, a building with a lot of people is a great thing. And I can't wait till we get to meet again and do that. But this is an intimate setting where God can speak to you, where you can reach out to people around you, where 
where you can share this on your social pages. It's never been easier for you to share the word of God than right now. You can share this message. You can comment on this message. So I would encourage you over the next couple days, over the next couple weeks, that you would be sharing the love of God, that you would be a lighthouse in the communities that you live in, in your uh, online presences, that they would show God, that people would say, those are ordinary people, but I can see that they've been with God. There's something different about them. And in this moment of tragedy, in this moment of hurt and pain, I want to know what they have. I want what they have. I want that peace that passes understanding. And it starts with praying dangerous prayers. God, make me somebody that you want me to be. Make me the person you've designed me to be. I want to be used by you in the capacity that you've created me for, God. And I'm willing to boldly go to places that you call me to. I'm willing to step into the, the callings on my life. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm excited for where this goes. Make sure you're commenting on this. Make sure you're liking it and sharing it. The whole point of this is to keep community. It's not just for me because I have to speak to you guys, right? But it is about continuing community even if we can't meet in person. And so I want you to comment. I want you to share this. I'm going to be commenting on it as well. I'm watching this live with you guys right now. I'm here to answer your questions. Let's have community. Let's have church like God intended it. Let's pray. God, thank you for, even in these crazy times, being omniscient, being omnipotent. Thank you for being everywhere. Thank you for being all.